brief period of time in the early 2000s, skateboarding video games were inescapable. The countercultural sport had been adapted into bits and bytes many times in the past, but following the genre-defining release of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater in 1999, it became one of the hottest commodities in gaming. Year after year, players couldn't stop shredding elaborate digital combos, and developers couldn't stop pumping out opportunities for players to do so. By 2007, however, the genre was getting tired. Its best games were struggling to advance beyond what had been established at the end of the preceding millennium, and its worst made it seem bloated and exploitative. It's in this window that EA Black Box introduced the world to skate. Where Pro Skater and most of the titles that succeeded it depicted skating as it appeared on TV, sensationalized and effortless, Skate attempted to depict the sport with greater realism than ever before. Performing a trick meant moving the joystick in a way that mimicked whatever it is one wanted to perform, rather than press a button to instantly grind or ollie. Skate would go on to become a critical and commercial darling, spawning a spin-off and two equally popular sequels in less than three years, only to disappear without a trace. Despite possessing considerable goodwill, extraneous factors would lead EA to abandon the series while it was ahead, leaving players hoping for a fourth Skate title out in the cold. This is the rise and fall of Skate. Skateboarding video games made their debut in the 1980s, with Atari developed titles such as 720 degrees and skateboarding, allowing gamers to shred their way through primitive cityscapes. Some of these early experiences would prove considerably popular, with the EA-developed Skate or Die for PCs and the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1988 grabbing many young players' attention, so much so that it was followed by a narrative-focused sequel, Skate or Die 2 The Search for Double Trouble, in 1990. But the genre would only truly hit the big time in 1999 with the release of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for the PlayStation. Developed by Neversoft alongside its titular Extreme Sports star, who provided continuous feedback and directional advice throughout its creation, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater offered one of the most intuitive and satisfying simulations of the sport yet. Maneuvering the game's skateboard into performing all manner of death-defying tricks felt sublime in a way that had never been previously captured by the genre. The game would go on to become a massive critical and commercial success, spawning a legion of equally popular sequels and spin-offs, and an even larger number of imitators. By the mid-2000s, however, things had begun to taper off. New entries in the Tony Hawk brand, such as American Wasteland and Project 8, had failed to inspire the same enthusiasm as their predecessors, and their copycats weren't picking up the slack. In the eyes of fans, the skateboarding genre had become stale, bogged down by the sheer glut of experiences that had been released since the late 90s, and by their collective failure to move past their predecessors' designs. It was around this time word got out that EA was planning on taking advantage of the genre's sagging fortunes and release a Tony Hawk killer on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. EA had previously attempted to enter the 3D skateboarding market in 2002 when it commissioned Criterion Games to create a 3D reboot of Skate or Die. According to a 2010 interview with Criterion's Alex Ward conducted by Games TM, the reboot would have allowed players to get off their board, walk around, and talk with non-playable characters, ideas that other skateboarding games would eventually adopt, but that were entirely new at the time. However, after EA demanded that this new skater die be large and feature-filled enough to compete with Grand Theft Auto, Criterion quickly became overwhelmed and the project fell apart. The game that would take its place was to be more focused in scope and handled by the company's Vancouver-based subsidiary, EA Black Box. Founded in 1998, Black Box had made a name for itself in the early 2000s, developing NHL and Need for Speed games, with their most acclaimed titles, Need for Speed Underground and Underground 2 becoming among the most beloved entries in the racing franchise. By 2005, however, the team was anxious to make a skateboarding game. As explained by the project's executive producer, Scott Blackwood, in a 2008 post-mortem with Gama Sutra, many of Black Box's staff were real-life skaters who had been wanting to bring something new to the digital version of the sport for some time, something different than what the Tony Hawk games had previously offered. 
Those games had offered traditional arcade experiences in which performing tricks was abstracted down to a single button press. Black Box, on the other hand, wanted to translate the physicality of controlling a board into what the player did with their hands when playing. If the player wanted to ollie, for example, they would have to do more than just press the X button on their controller. They would have to hold their joystick down and snap it upwards to mimic the crouch and jump one does when performing an ollie in real life. This idea, which would eventually become known as the Flick It system, was met with approval from EA's heads and Black Box got to work. Rather than immediately create a rudimentary 3D environment in which they could test their ideas, the team instead started prototyping the Flickit system using an entirely text-based game controlled by a single stick. Managed by a tiny internal team, the prototype would read however the player moved the stick and respond with what trick that input had resulted in. After prototyping the project in this manner for an entire year, Black Box began expanding it into a full game in late 2005 using a flexible physics package called Drives to simulate the feel of skateboarding in 3D space as accurately as possible. A modestly sized open world rife with opportunities to shred one's heart out quickly came into being, and the Flickit system expanded to include both left and right sticks, with the left one controlling the movement and direction of the player, and the right one their actions with their board. Eventually, after two and a half years of work, Black Box's passion project coalesced into a flagpole release for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in September of 2007. A groundbreaking experience called Skate. Taking place in San Vanalona, a fictional mashup of San Francisco, Vancouver, and Barcelona, Skate sees the player attempt to become the next big name in extreme sports by completing objectives all over the city. From racking up enough points to beat competing skaters to pulling off stunts in no skate zones patrolled by security guards, the game has the player engage in all manners of activities that push their love of the sport and the flicket system to their limit. Outside of its main campaign, Skate also offered a host of online events for players to partake in, allowing wannabe birdmen to cross the globe to compete for the best scores, speeds, and lines. Players could also record 30-second clips of their exploits and upload them to the game's official website. While subsequent titles would eclipse its online offerings, it was more than enough for Skate to receive a warm reception from fans and critics upon release. After slowly watching Tony Hawk and its derivatives lose their luster, Skate represented a fresh and well-executed take on the genre, with the Flickit system the perfect antidote to the miasma that had previously been suffocating it. Come on, champ. Reviews of the game were not unanimously glowing. Some critics felt the game's challenges and world could have used an additional coat of polish, while others felt the Flickit system's learning curve to be a little too steep, especially for newcomers. Many also noted the disparity between the two versions of the game. As was common with early multi-platform titles of its generation, Skate's PlayStation version had its technical shortcomings, including a less than stellar frame rate when things started moving too fast. But even with these issues, most agreed that Skate was an incredible first effort on Black Box's part. A mobile version of the game would also launch the same day as the console version. Featuring a highly simplified version of the main game's plot, controls, and setting, the mobile adaptation would receive a modicum of positive buzz from what few outlets picked it up, but failed to generate much fanfare. The console version of Skate, on the other hand, would go on to create a massive splash at retail, eclipsing the sales of Tony Hawk's Proving Ground, which would release the following month to mixed reviews. EA Games president Frank Jabot would make note of this in February of the following year, stating that Black Box's title had greatly exceeded their expectations in doing so, and that it would be getting a sequel as a result. But before the world would receive Skate 2, a visit to Nintendo was in order. While many third-party developers were not as privy to Nintendo as they were to Sony or Microsoft during the late 2000s, EA still saw most of its sport franchises released on the Big N's consoles. Underpowered as they were, the Wii and the DS had humongous install bases of players, some of whom had likely already played Skate on the HD consoles and were ravenous for more. 
As a result, once it was apparent that Skate was a hit, Black Box would get to work on creating spin-offs for both systems while they worked on a proper sequel, collaborating with EA's Montreal studio for the Wii version and Exeunt Entertainment for the DS version. These spin-offs, both titled Skate It, would release together in November of 2008 to a lukewarm reaction. Uh, of San Vanalona has been left devastated by a series of freak disasters. San emergency services have now evacuated over 99% of the city's population. A remarkable feat that has left a once bustling metropolis a virtual ghost town. Yeah, yeah, that'll work perfect. Many critics were appreciative of the game's sizable story mode, multiplayer offerings, and my spot functionality, which allows players to create their own rudimentary skate parks. More divisive, however, would be the way that both games were controlled. Flicking it on the Wii is done by gesturing with the Wii Remote, or for those who dared, the Wii Balance Board, while the DS has the player draw on the touchscreen with a stylus. Most agreed that these control schemes just weren't as easy or intuitive as flicking a joystick, but where some found them to be absolutely deal-breaking, others contended that once they wrapped their head around them, they weren't as bad or as gimmicky as one might expect. Like Skate before it, Skate It's console versions would be accompanied at launch by a mobile adaptation, this time exclusively for iPhones. Little more than a port of the DS version, the title would be largely overlooked, with those few that played it finding its touch-only version of the Flick It control scheme to be unique, but too awkward to wholeheartedly recommend. None of Skate It's iterations would prove as memorable as the game that came before them. And while the Wii version of the game actually sold decently, especially when compared to other third-party offerings on Nintendo's motion-controlled console, neither it nor the DS version lit any sales charts on fire. But the amount of thought and care that was put into them was respectable. And in just two months, the world was about to receive a proper follow-up to the original Skate. During the first Skate's production, Black Box outlined designs of where they would want to take the series should a hypothetical Skate 2 and Skate 3 ever be greenlit. According to Scott Blackwood in the Gama Sutra Postmortem, the studio didn't know with absolute certainty whether their passion project would ever expand out into a trilogy. But if it did, they had a strong idea of what it is that players would want from each entry. For example, they predicted that while most fans would be pleased with the feel of skateboarding in the first, some might be disappointed by the fact that they couldn't get off their board and would likely want to do so by the next title. Thus, when Skate 2 launched in January of 2009, players found themselves not only able to disembark from their boards, but engage in a host of activities that felt right at home in the sequel. Following the earthquakes that occurred in Skate It, San Vanalona has been rebuilt by the nefarious Mongo Corp and utterly outlawed skating. Determined to teach the man that skateboarding is not a crime, the player takes to the streets, performing similar tasks and challenges to what was featured in the first skate to reclaim the city. When on their board, the player can now grab the terrain around them and take one or both feet off, allowing for new tricks and moves previously impossible with the first skate's flick it system, such as hand plants and hippie jumps. Meanwhile, when on foot, the player can rearrange many objects they come across in San Vandalona, allowing them to set up their environment in ways that allow them to more easily shred up the city and complete objectives. Most of these changes are also saved to the game's memory, meaning that the player can return to any previously manipulated section of the city and not have to redo their work. Between these mechanical changes, brand new modes like the Thrasher Magazine-inspired Hall of Meat, which tasks the player with injuring themselves as creatively as possible to score points, and the inclusion of challenging new online activities that one could play cooperatively with friends, players found much to love about the sequel. While each mainline game in the Skate series would go on to be more or less equally well received among fans, Skate 2 arguably remains the best regarded of the three. In the eyes of many fans, it refined an already great experience into an even greater one. And unlike the title that would follow, it brought just enough new content to fully justify its existence and feel like its own game. Like the series' first title, Skate 2 would go on to perform well at retail, especially compared to its competitors' offerings. After watching the market become divided following the release of the first Skate, 
Neversoft handed off development duties of the Tony Hawk games to a new developer named Robomoto, who decided that their best chance at success would be to try and differentiate the series as much as possible from EA's offerings. Inspired by the rise in popularity of games played with large plastic peripherals like Guitar Hero and Rock Band, Robomoto debuted a plastic skateboard that players would stand on and manipulate as one would an actual skateboard for 2009's Tony Hawk Ride. In a way, Skate and Ride were guided by similar philosophies. Both believed in having the player mimic whatever move they wanted to perform in the game with a corresponding apparatus in real life and doing away with previous abstractions. But where manipulating a joystick when playing Skate was quick and intuitive, manipulating the Ride board was cumbersome and frustrating. The game would go on to be poorly received critically and commercially, and would be followed up by a 2010 sequel, Tony Hawk Shred, that would sell even more abysmally. For the time being, Black Box was the uncontested king of the skateboarding market. Unfortunately, through no fault of its own, things were about to turn south at the Canadian studio. Session today on Friday. I'm winning! And we're playing Carbon, <laughs> and Drew is winning. Only a few days after Skate 2's launch, Reports surfaced online that a massive amount of Black Box's staff had been laid off, with some numbers going as high as about two-thirds of the studio's 350 employees. The move came on the heels of EA announcing that it would be cutting 10% of its worldwide workforce in order to accommodate for losses the company had experienced in 2008. Shortly thereafter, what remained of Black Box would be relocated to EA Canada's offices in the Vancouver suburb of Burnaby in June of 2009 whereafter development of the next skate game would resume. It was a sudden and rough transition for the team, and yet despite this, Skate 3 would arrive like clockwork just under a year later, in May of 2010. Set in Port Carverton, a welcoming metropolis that embraces extreme sports instead of shunning them, Skate 3 sees the player use the clout they obtained during Skate 2 to become the next great skating magnate. While most of the challenges that the player engages in on the road to stardom are the same as before, a strong emphasis is placed this time on accruing a squad of teammates to be a part of the player's empire, which participate in various events and activities alongside the player. On paper, Skate 3 has a lot going for it. There are more tricks to learn. Old modes, such as the Skate Park Editor and the Hall of Meat, and new options and features that significantly add to its replay value. Meanwhile, the game's online functionalities provided a much more robust experience than what had been offered in the past, with most of the game's objectives now able to be enjoyed cooperatively with other players over the internet, and a built-in social media platform called Skate Feed that showed other players' recent activity, providing continuous stimulation. But as interesting as these features were, Many critics felt that in practice, they weren't quite enough. The game continued to look and feel as great as the series had ever been. But where Skate 2 felt like a substantial enough evolution of the series' first entry, Skate 3 just felt like another iteration of what had come before. A strong iteration to be sure, one that longtime fans could safely buy knowing they'd get a quality experience, and newcomers would probably be best serviced getting over its predecessors, but an iteration all the same. Like 1 and 2 before it, Skate 3 would sell strongly at retail, but this time around, EA wouldn't be as keen about the franchise's future prospects. In an interview with Kotaku in December of 2010, former EA head John Riccatello would claim that while action sports games as a whole would continue, he believed that the skateboarding genre had run its course. At roughly a little under 5 million units sold across the PlayStation 3 and the 360, Skate 3 had done very well by any other studio standards, but within EA, it was still the weakest link when compared to the company's other gargantuan sports franchises, such as FIFA or Madden. It may have come to be seen as an unnecessary part of EA's portfolio, a fifth wheel that wasn't upending the rest of the company's operations, but was still taking up resources that might be better serviced on more lucrative ventures. Whatever the exact reason, Skate 3 would end up being the last game in its series. The year following the third Skate Games release, Black Box would develop 2011's Need for Speed The Run. The game received a mixed reaction, and in February of the following year, EA announced that the studio had been hit with layoffs again, and that its remaining staff would shift over to creating online free-to-play and social games. Black Box would soon after be renamed Quickline Games and assigned to produce content for the freemium MMO Need for Speed World, 
before being closed for good in April of 2013. The studio's closure was immensely discouraging to those hoping EA would still reverse course on Skate. However, a source of hope was about to come from an unexpected place. How's it going, Rez? My name's PewDiePie. Welcome to Skate 3. This game is actually kind of old, but I heard it was hilarious. So I thought we were just going to go freestyling and see what's going to happen. I don't know. Are you ready for it, Bob? Bob is excited. Look at him. So happy. In August of 2014, it was reported that Let's Play videos of Skate 3 recorded by megalithic YouTube personalities such as PewDiePie had proven so popular that UK retailer Game requested that EA print more copies of the four-year-old title. While the videos in question were not especially flattering, showcasing the buggy nature of the game's Hall of Meat mode, and the incident as a whole arguably spoke more to the power of internet personalities than to Skate 3 itself. It gave fans, still hoping that EA would take interest in their series again, new reason to be optimistic. Better yet, the Tony Hawk franchise seemed as if it were poised to make a comeback as well. After hitting rock bottom with Ride and Shred, developer Robomoto licked its wounds with 2012's Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD, a high-definition amalgamation of the first two Pro Skater games. The reboot received flack for lacking content and messing with the feel of the original game's physics, but it was still a decent enough return to form, and now Robomoto was gearing up to launch Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 the following year. If there was anything that could convince EA to revitalize Skate, it would be seeing another series eat its lunch. And even if it didn't come back, fans of the genre would at least have a great new experience to play in its stead. Unfortunately, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 would be critically panned upon launch, with players deriding the game's abundance of technical issues and awkward controls. After being given an unexpected second wind thanks to YouTube, Pro Skater 5 had again cast doubt on skateboarding games' ability to succeed, and EA wasn't about to express pity. In an interview with IGN the following August, EA's then-Chief Competition Officer Peter Moore would state that while they knew many people wanted a new skate title, the company wasn't interested in delving into their back catalog. Realizing that EA was unlikely to motivate itself to develop Skate 4 anymore, fans took it upon themselves in 2016 to start aggressively lobbying for the game's creation on social media. EA's official Twitter account, Instagram account, and more became flooded with thousands of posts demanding that the gaming giant revive the series with the hashtag MakeEASkateAgain, becoming a staple by which fans continue to vent their frustration. It's been almost seven years. Skate 3 is getting boring. My Xbox is of no use because of you. Just make the game before I sue. Fans rejoiced on January 28, 2017, when EA community manager Daniel Lingen tweeted, hashtag Skate 4, out of the blue. After years of waiting, Lingen's unexpected message suggested that the ephemeral title was finally progressing. Unfortunately, EA CEO Andrew Wilson would quickly quash expectations, stating at the company's quarterly investors call three days later that it was not presently making Skate 4. Fans still hopeful that the game would eventually see the light of day found their excitement peaked once more in mid-2018, when it was discovered that after switching them off in 2016, EA had quietly reopened Skate 3 servers days before their E3 press conference. The timing seemed too auspicious. Unless it had been a mistake, there was no reason for EA to have brought them back. Yet EA's conference would once again come and go without so much as a peep from the series. Elsewhere at E3, however, a new skateboarding game titled Session was grabbing headlines. A Kickstarter success story from the Montreal-based Creature Studios, Session attracted frustration from some jolted that it wasn't a new skate, and accolades from others happy to see 3D skateboarding games continue to be represented. Though it bears resemblance to EA's own series, Session's five-man team intends to offer a more realistic game than the former foregoing genre staples such as the scoring system in favor of a tonally and mechanically deeper experience. Assuming Creature Studios fully delivers on its potential, Session looks to be a strong title, one that may satisfy many jilted skate fans when it launches in 2019. But for better or for worse, it won't quite be Skate 4. Over the past decade, EA has repeatedly stated and shown that it is only willing to invest in projects 
that it believes will reach as large an audience as possible. The company has all of the capital and the resources to assemble a new black box capable of creating the next gate, but if the series is perceived as being part of an underground niche, and that niche's most recent release is a title as reviled as Pro Skater 5, it's unlikely that it will bite. Ultimately, the future of the Skate series will depend not on how many times fans write Skate 4 on EA's Instagram profile, but on how popular other independent developer skateboarding games prove to be. If Session and more significantly surpass expectations, then EA might finally be inspired to revive Skate. But if they don't, then the famed Tony Hawk competitor will likely continue to remain dormant. Our documentaries are crowdfunded and made possible by the generous supporters backing us on Patreon. If you enjoy our content, consider subscribing to our channel and becoming a patron to help us create more. Thank you.